John chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through Him. And apart from Him, not one thing was created that has been created. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, The Gospel of John is found on page 941 in the Black Pew Bibles, if you're using one of those. Otherwise, uh, it is the fourth book in the New Testament. I've never preached through a gospel before. I've preached from the Gospel of John. I've never preached through the Gospel uh, of John. John has always seemed to be, in my mind, the holy grail of the New Testament scriptures. Uh, There are certain books preachers don't touch for a little bit in their ministry. You've got uh, Romans, you've got Galatians, which I don't know if I ever touched those two. Uh, You've got sort of Isaiah in the the Old Testament, which uh, I love the name, name my son after that, but not sure if I'm willing to go into that uh, just yet. And then you've got the Gospel of John. And John, if you've read the Gospel of John, it's, a, it's an interesting gospel. It, it is, uh, on the one hand, an amazingly simple, yet profoundly deep gospel. Uh, many have said that John's gospel is shallow enough for a child to wade, and yet deep enough for an elephant to swim. Uh, John MacArthur would say that John's gospel is as gentle as a lamb and as bold as a lion as deep as the ocean and as high as the heavens. It is on the one hand an amazingly simple yet profoundly deep gospel. Martin Luther would call this the chief gospel. And if it seems like I'm really excited to begin John's gospels, because I am, and if you're sitting there unexcited to begin John's gospel, well, maybe you can think to yourself, Roy's really excited, so I might listen in for just a few minutes. Uh, Now, I really do love the author of the gospel himself, uh, John, who never actually refers to himself as John throughout his narrative, but he does repeatedly uh, refer to himself, and I love this, as the disciple whom Jesus loved, or the one whom Jesus loved. If you had the choice between calling yourself John or the disciple whom Jesus loved, I think it's quite an easy choice uh, to make. John was uh, blown away. He was taken back time and time again about the simple truth that Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Well, I guess in John's case, it was for Jesus himself has told me so, but that really does appear to be the driving force of John's ministry. Uh, He's known as the gospel of love, uh, sorry, the the apostle of love. He's known as the apostle of love throughout church history. Uh, Someone has, has speculated over 80 times in his collective writings, does John refer to this idea of love? Uh, 25 times in his gospel, 20 times in his epistle, he refers to the concept of truth. Uh, and, and over 100 times does John refer to the word believe. And so putting all those three together, uh, it's not hard for us to see that John wants us to believe in the truth of Christ so that we may enter into a, a relationship of love with the Father, Son, in spirit. And in fact, uh, the purpose of John's gospel, why he even writes his gospel, it's sort of a, a big evangelistic tract because he tells us this in chapter 20, verse 31, where he says, I have written these things so that you, the reader of this gospel, may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. You may have life in his name to believe the truth of Jesus so that we enter into a relationship of love. And so in light of all of these things, I think uh, if I could give sort of a a subtext for the Gospel of John, if I could kind of give a title to the Gospel of John, it would be uh, John, a divine invitation into the fullness of eternal life. A divine invitation into the fullness of eternal life. This is not a book with a bunch of fun stories about an ancient man in the Middle East doing some nice things for some really bad people. And if we miss the point of what John is doing here in this narrative, then we miss the point of his gospel and we miss entering into eternal life, the fullness of eternal life. This is not a feel-good story for human morality. 
This is a divine invitation, says John. He's saying, I've written these things. The the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, is calling us in to participate within the divine life of the Son of God. That we may come into union with Christ and have the fullness of joy of having our sins forgiven, of being adopted and having an eternal Father and having the Spirit of God dwelling in us to give us life, not just life after we die, but life today, the fullness of life with Christ. And so that is the purpose, that is the reason for why John is writing these things. And so if that's the overall point of the book, then <clears throat> chapter uh, John 1, 1-5 uh, is the main point of this morning's sermon is this. We're going to see that we have been made by Jesus and for Jesus to enter into that fullness of life that John is speaking about. We've been made by Jesus and for Jesus to enter into the fullness of eternal life. So uh, with that being said, let's go to God one last time in prayer, and then we're going to read these first five verses and see what God has for us. A gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, we do uh, come to you now with the joy the privilege it is to be here with your people in your house, worshipping your holy name. Father, we thank you for your wonderful grace that you've extended to the Lloyds in uh, giving them a grandchild. What a joy it is that you grant life. Father, I pray for Heather and Wade that they, they would just seek to raise this child in the ways of the Lord so that this child may know the joy of her Redeemer. Father, as we embark also on one of the greatest journeys of the New Testament Scriptures, help us, Lord, to find Christ, to see Christ, to savor Christ in every nook and cranny of this gospel, to faithfully see and to savor all of the beauty of Jesus found on the pages of John's gospel. And as we come now to the subject of the Word, the eternal Logos, Father, we ask that you would open our eyes to behold wondrous things from your law. And we ask and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hamilton, Chicago, Annie, Phantom of the Opera, Fiddler on the Roof, Aladdin. These are just some of the biggest Broadway musical uh, hits to ever hit the stage of New York City in the last 30 or something years. And although uh, you probably couldn't get a more distinct set of Broadway musicals, all of these shows do appear to have one thing in common. All of these shows begin with what we would call an overture, a preview, the opening notes to the show. See, if you've ever had the privilege of attending a Broadway musical, then you would know that uh, before the curtain ever opens, the conductor steps into the pit and the orchestra plays the overture, the prelude, a preliminary piece of music that serves as a teaser to the rest of the show. And and a point of an overture, the point of an overture is to uh, introduce you to all of the major themes and notes that are going to be fully developed once the curtains open and the storyline of the actors step onto the stage. An overture. That's what we have in these first 18 verses of John's Gospel. His prologue is what we would call an overture, a preliminary piece of music that serves as a teaser to the rest of his Gospel. John is introducing us in these first 18 verses to all of those major themes and ideas that are going to be fully developed once the curtain opens and the storyline of the actors step onto the stage in verse 19. And so if you look down in your Bibles in these first 18 verses, you just skim the first 18 verses, you will notice words like light and life, rejection, belief, darkness and goodness, glory, grace, truth. All of these themes and many more that will be later developed in the remaining 21 chapters. But for this morning, we're just going to focus on the first five verses, and we're going to focus on one of the themes in those first five verses, theme number one, and what we will call 
the eternal and divine word of God. The eternal and divine word of God. Notice how John begins his gospel. He says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. There's a certain cadence to the way that John writes here. There's certain musical notes in the Greek that he kind of fleshes out that we can kind of see in the English. Even in the English without reading it from the Greek, we can see that that, that there's a certain structure and rhythm to the way that John writes. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and he was with God in the beginning. He's very purposeful, very intentional in the way that he writes this introduction. And and in fact, the very first thing we learn about John's gospel, right from the very beginning, the first thing he draws our attention to as we open up to its very first verse is that this will be a gospel that will be centered upon and it will be focused around what he calls the word of God, the eternal and divine logos. Now, we know from reading John's prologue, if we were to just read these first 18 verses, this uh, overture, we would know that the word here in verse 1 is a reference to a person. And that person is, in fact, the Lord Jesus Christ. We know because in verse 14, John gives us a little bit more clue. Uh, The word became flesh. He dwelt among us. And then if we have any uh, still... um, uh, We're not sure, verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So we know that the word here in verse 1 is referring to Jesus, whom he refers to as the word. And there are several reasons why he gives Jesus this title of word. Firstly, words reveal things. We know that. Words reveal what a person is like, what a person is thinking. They tell us uh, what a person hates, what a person loves. Words communicate the internal thoughts that a person has. So John is using the word word here, logos, to say that this word's going to be revealing something to its readers. Secondly, uh, words create things. Uh, Words can create faith and life in a person's soul. We heard the word of truth, the gospel, and we believed. Words can affect the way that we interact with other people. They can build people up. Words can tear people down. So words create things in a way that nothing else in this world can. Thirdly, words accomplish things. Words get things done, in other words. Uh, in the Jewish mindset and several times of the Old Testament, God's word is said to have been sent forth by him to accomplish his purposes and plans. Uh, Psalm 33 says that by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. He spoke and it came to be. Uh, Ezekiel 24, I, the Lord, have spoken. The time is coming and I will act. So God acts through speaking. Or most famously, Isaiah 55, 11, and so shall my word be that goes from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that for which I purpose. And so words accomplish things. And so uh, putting all of those together, John uses the word logos essentially to say that this word, this logos will be throughout these 21 chapters revealing, he will be creating, he will be doing, he will be accomplishing, and he will be making things. Or to put it another way, uh, this word reveals God's mind, he expresses God's will, he displays God's heart, he exposes God's perfections, and he accomplishes God's plan. The word of God is God himself, expressed in creation, in redemption, in revelation and salvation. That's why John uses the word. The word reveals things. He creates things. He gets things done. And there are five distinct features that John wants to tell us about the Word here in these first five verses that we're going to spend the rest of our time briefly, briefly touching upon these five things. So five things that this Word reveals about who He is in relation to God, who He is in relation to creation. Five things that John tells us about this Word. The Word is eternal. He is personal or relational. He's divine. He's powerful And he is definitely life-giving. The word is eternal. Have a look again with me at verse 1. John begins, in the beginning was. In the beginning was 
the Word. Now, if I just came up and said, in the beginning, you will know that phrase from which Old Testament book? The book of Genesis. Thank you. So John, by using that phrase, in the beginning, would have immediately caught the attention of his Jewish readers who were reading his word. And that would have hearkened them back to the beginning of time and telling us about the word. Namely, that before time began, this word didn't come into existence. The word in the beginning already was. Notice that John doesn't say, uh, in the beginning, the word began. Or in the beginning, the word came to be. In the beginning, the word was created. He doesn't say any of that, but rather he says that in the beginning, way back when beginnings began, the word already was. That there was never a time when the word was not. That little word was there in the Greek. It kind of speaks of an ongoing existence in past time. This is an imperfect tense verb, which simply means that it's an ongoing action of the noun that it's being used of. And in the context of John 1.1, the action of the noun speaks of ongoing existence in past time or ongoing existence prior to everything else. So prior to creation, prior to time, prior to Genesis 1.1, before Elohim even created the heavens and the earth, the Word already was. Jesus Christ didn't begin to exist. He, He wasn't created first. He's not the first created being. He always was. He is eternal. John does not want you to be mistaken. This Word is forever. In fact, he uses the same verb three times to make the point. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. It's the same verb so that we will not miss the point. There was never a time when the word was not. All of that to say, my dear friends, whatever you can say about the eternality of God in Genesis 1.1, you can say about the word in John 1. One. He links the word to Genesis and says that before God spoke, the word was in the beginning with God, and he, in fact, was creating life. The word is eternal. Characteristic number two that we learn is that the word is personal. The word is relational. Have a look again, verse 1. In the beginning was the word, notice, and the word was with God, the Word was with God. God was not by Himself in the, or before the beginning in the beginning. God was with someone else. God was with another person. The Greek here is proston theon. That speaks of a, an orientation and a, and a relational um, relationship that this Word was in. The Word was facing toward God. He was in a relationship with God. He's not some impersonal force created by God. He's not an analogy or metaphor for God. He's not some emanation from God, but God and the Word are part of the same substantial relationship. He was intimately relational and in communion with God. This is, in other words, John's saying this. This is not one person changing their mode between two different identities. This is not God saying, one day I'm God, the next I'm the Logos. One day I'm the Logos, then I decide I'm going to be God. One day I'm Peter Parker, the next day I'm Spider-Man. That's not how he's describing. He says that the Word is with God. John will not allow for some kind of modalistic existence between the two. John distinguishes between two separate, distinct, yet co-equal people who are in a peer-to-peer relationship, the Word and God, the Word and God. The Word is in a relationship with Theos, God. Now, again, this gets back to that idea that the Word reveals the inner thoughts of God. Uh, In the same way, our human thoughts relate to our inaudible thoughts. So if you want to know what I'm thinking, the only way for you to know that is for me to speak with my words. Now, I know, don't, please don't send me emails this week going, what about body language or what about other things or what about emotion? All of those things uh, kind of point us toward the fact that even uh, people who, 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 who can't really use their words to talk, they still communicate using well, another form of words. They want to use their words. And it's the same for God. So, so how do we know what God loves? What's going on in God's heart, his mind? What does he hate? What is he like? 
Well, John tells us that the word here is with God, and because he's with God, he reveals God. He knows what God's like because he is with the Father. The word is the very self-expression of God here in verse 18. And so in the same way that our words reveal what's going on in our hearts, God's word reveals his. All of that to say, again, dear friends, this word is deeply personal. He is a relational person. And we will see that as we make our way through John's gospel. Thirdly, thirdly, and perhaps the main point that John wants us to see here, if you miss everything else, don't miss this point. The Word is God. The Word is full deity, fully God, equal to God. He is divine. This is where John's Greek gets really exciting. I'm going to show you something that I discovered in preparation by another person who pointed this out to me. And ever since they did, I've never read John 1.1 the same. I've never read these verses the same. So I'm going to show you something of the brilliance and the musical genius that John uses to write here. Okay, so, so notice, you can either look in your Bibles or put it up on the screen. In these first two verses, the first two verses are composed of five lines of poetry. Let me show you what I mean. Line one, in the beginning was the word. Line two, and the word was with God. Line three, and the word was God. Line four, he was with God. Line five, in the beginning. So we start to look at these five lines and we notice a few similarities. Line one and line five are designed to actually go together. They are literary partners. Line one, in the beginning was the word. Line five, in the beginning. Seems incidental enough, quite coincidental, but then you start to make your way one step further into the centre, and you notice that line four, uh, line four and line two are also designed to be literary partners. Line two, and the word was with God. Line four, he was with God. Stressing the word's uniquely designed relationship. God was with the word. So what is the only line that does not have a literary partner? Line three and the bullseye of the target, the main point that John is making. He's making an argument from the lesser to the greater, and the greater and the greatest argument, he says, and the word was God. The word is fully divine, none other than God himself. And so, dear friends, when you're friendly neighborhood JWs come knocking on your door and you want to hide away in your bedroom, not talking to them because they're going to bring out their Greek uh, testaments of uh, the, the New World Translation. And they're going to tell you that if you are brave enough to answer that door, that uh, because there is no definite article, definite article is simply T-H-E, uh, before the word at the end of verse 1, uh, before the word God at the end of verse 1, uh, they're going to say this, that it, in the Greek, it, it reads like this, uh, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was a God, small g, small g, lesser God, created being. That's the argument they use. There's no definite article, so we have to use an indefinite term, a God. The word wasn't God, he was a God, a kind of lesser God, a demigod, if you will. Now, there are several problems with that argument, as you can immediately see. Uh, Firstly, John has already said that the word is uncreated. He is eternal. That the little word was speaks of ongoing existence in past time. So he cannot be created because he's uncreated. John's already made that argument. Now, that destroys their philosophy and theology straight up, but if they are persistent, uh, you can also bring to their attention this five lines of poetry and the argument that John wants them to see, that the word is actually God, as he makes the argument from uh, the lesser to the greater. Thirdly, if they're still there by that point and haven't ran off, uh, I want you to tell them that there are 282 times in the New Testament where the word theos, God, uh, is used without the definite article T-H-E. But only 16 times in their Jehovah's Witness Bible will they translate it as a God. 
282 times, and they only pick up on that 16 times. So not even they're, they're consistent with their own theology and practice. So you could point out that to their inconsistencies. Or you could tell them uh, that John, for what he wants to say here in the Greek, this is the only way that he could have said it. Because if John had put a definite article before the word God here at the end of verse 1, the Greek would have read, and the word was the God. And the word was the God, referring to the God he just referenced, thus making the word and God interchangeable terms for one person. But as we have seen, this is not one person. There are two people because the word was with another. And if he's with another, he can't be with himself. So that would collapse the father-son distinction if John had put the definite article like they're wanting him to put there. And that is actually a heresy that leads people to hell called modalism. But as we've seen, God doesn't expose himself in different modes, but two persons. Fifth, if John... uh, was wanting to say that Jesus was a kind of demigod. He would have been stoned to death. He's a monotheistic Jew. He would have been breaking the first commandment, have no other gods before me. So again, that argument doesn't hold up. And then lastly, if all else fails, just simply tell them that without a divine savior, you are still under divine wrath because you need a sinless substitute who is without sin. And the only person without sin is God himself. And if Jesus is not God, then you do not have a sufficient savior. No mere human is able to bear the weight of divine justice. And so the word must and is God, the divine word of God. And again, that's a major theme that we're going to pick up. All of that to say, dear friends, John is very intentional in telling us about the word who is divine. He's eternal, he's relational, he's divine. Fourthly, second last point, he's powerful. He's very powerful, in fact, because verse 3 tells us, all things were created through him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. So again, this is just another way for John to say, hey, Jesus, this word, he's divine. He's divine because he has the power to create life from nothing. Only God is the creator. Only God can create. Jesus can create things. Jesus is God. It's not hard to follow here. By his word, back in Genesis 1, all things came to be. By the word in John 1, all things came to be. Positively, through him all things were made. Negatively, without him, nothing has been made that has been made. So whether you look at it both positively or negatively, John states it explicitly, Jesus Christ is God. He is the active agent in creation because he created creation. And if he created all things, Jesus alone has the authority to govern all things, to order all things, to command all things. He has the ability to, let's say, raise people from the dead, as we will see in John's gospel. He has the ability to walk on water. He has the ability to control his environment because he is God. And Paul makes a similar argument in Colossians chapter 1. For by him, that is Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. All things were created through him and for him. All things were created through Jesus and for Jesus. We've been made by Jesus and for Jesus, which is why John is making the argument that you can only find life in the one who made you for himself. Because if you've been made by Jesus and for Jesus, then you've been made to enter into a relationship with Jesus, which means that if you try and find your hope, your purpose in anything other outside of Jesus Christ in this world, then you will come up bankrupt. You will come up short. You will come up lacking. And you will not find the, the, the satisfaction that your heart desires because you've not been made for for the things of this world our ultimate place is in christ in christ alone that is where our hearts were made to be and where they should find their rest we've not been made by our jobs and for our jobs we've not been made by our money or for our money by sex or for sex by our kids or for our kids we've not been made by our homes or for our homes by our spouse or for our spouse we've been made by Jesus for Jesus because it is only Jesus where eternal life is found 
And so John is both qualifying what he means for, for the word to be God, but he's also touching upon the deepest center of the human heart. And he says that you've been made by this word. And this word is deeply personal and relational. And he wants you to enter into that fullness of joy that he's presenting. Again, this is something that's going to be come to us again and again throughout John's gospel. Which leads us into our very last point here this morning. The word is life-giving. Have a look at verses 4 and 5 with me. Uh, in him was life. That life was the light of men. And that light shines in the darkness. And yet the darkness did not overcome it. I love what Frederick Bruner in his commentary on uh, John says here. He says, uh, here in verse 4, we see an invitation, and the invitation is this. Come into union with the Word who made you, and you will come to life. You came from Him. Please come back to Him. You were made for Him, and the result of this reunion will be more than human existence. It will be life. So remember, the whole purpose of John's gospel, the whole reason he writes is so that we would, what? Believe in Jesus and have life. Life in his name. This idea of having life in Jesus. That, that, that in him was life, says John here in verse 4. In him is life. That's sort of, there's, a, a lot of the times in John, there's double meanings. And it's, it's frustrating for the preacher. It's great for you, for you guys who just get to listen. But in him was life in two senses. Number one, Jesus created all life. He's just told us that in verse 3. So, so if Jesus is the author of life, he sustains life, he created life, all things came to be through this word, then logically, he, in him is life. Physical life is upheld and sustained by the word. The only reason this building isn't falling in and crushing us now is because Jesus upholds it by the power of his word, Hebrews chapter 1. So if he created all life, it follows. All life is in him. He's the source of life. All physical life is made and sustained by Jesus. Secondly, however, this word life can also refer not just to physical life, but to spiritual life. That is that in Jesus is found the only place to have life, eternal life in Christ. But it's even something much more beyond just life after death. Now, John is talking about a quantity of life that goes on forever and eternity once we die. Eternal life, yes, but he's also talking about life before death. That is a fullness of life that is centered around the word that has its joy and fulfillment in the darkest possible places of this world. So that life in Jesus looks like joy in the midst of suffering. It looks like abundant life and abundant joy and abundant peace and abundant hope even when you have no reason to rejoice in life because the darkness seems to be creeping around. He's saying that Jesus possesses the good life, the life that is marked by this, not just a never-ending quantity, but a transcendent quality. Jesus gives a joy to the human heart that nothing else in this world can give. We were made to be in relationship with this Jesus. But to experience those things, friends, you have to first be introduced to the person of Jesus, which is what John is doing in these opening verses. To experience eternal life, you need to be introduced to the person and work of Jesus because... Eternal life is exclusively his to give. In him was life. And notice that life is the light of men. So this life, this eternal life, this eternal word, when men see him and understand him for who he truly is, Jesus becomes a light unto their path, a light unto the way. When Jesus comes into the world, he comes bringing hope and light into the world. And we're going to see that again. I am the light of the world, Jesus says in this gospel. He's drawing out these themes. He's a masterful composer, this John. But then notice, let's finish with verse 5, how John finishes this beautiful passage of Scripture. He says, And the light shines in the darkness, 
and yet the darkness did not overcome it. The darkness did not overcome it. Up until this point, in these first five verses, John has been using past tense or past continuing tense verbs. Now, that doesn't sound at all exciting until you understand why that's exciting now in verse 5 when John actually introduces us to a present active continuing tense. Still not exciting until I explain it like this. The action of this light, in other words, it's an ongoing action that is unceasing. So, so let me just say it like this. The darkness, says John, it doesn't win. That's the easiest way I can explain it, right? John, John's not saying the darkness has once been defeated or beaten, but it's now sort of coming back and making its, its ground in 2021. The darkness is sort of coming back and the light's getting defeated. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that the darkness has been defeated. The darkness is continuing to be defeated. Present tense, continuing action. It's continuing to be defeated and it will continue to be defeated up until death is defeated, up until the last enemy to be defeated is death. For he must reign until he puts all of his enemies under his feet and the last enemy to be defeated by him is death, 1 Corinthians 15. And so the light, of, uh, the light of the word made flesh, the one who was in the beginning, the one who is God, his victory over darkness as seen in the crucifixion, as seen at the resurrection at Calvary's hill, John says that light of the world, Jesus Christ, is shining light into dark places and the darkness cannot overcome it. The darkness will continue to be defeated since Jesus has come into the world. Regardless of your week, regardless of the pervasive darkness that seems to be creeping around you in your workplace, in your home, in that child's life of yours, regardless of the pandemics, of the persecutions, the free speech that is being ripped away from Christians, the darkness will not overcome the light. The light always wins. We know how the story ends, says John. We know how the story ends. This is hope here in John 1, 5. The story ends with that Lamb of God beckoning his bride to come and enjoy life in his presence. And what John does all throughout this gospel is he shows Jesus to be the fullness of everything our hearts desire. He will show us time and time again he is the fullness of the Father, the fullness of the Son, the fullness of eternity, the fullness of forgiveness, the fullness of humanity. He's the fullness of wine, the fullness of bread, the fullness of water, the fullness of joy, the fullness of peace, the fullness of the law, the fullness of the scriptures in every single way imaginable. Jesus Christ is the fullness of everything we need. And so I am very excited to begin this gospel because this gospel speaks of what our hearts were created for. We have been made by Jesus and for Jesus to enter into the fullness of eternal life. Let's pray. Well, Father, we do come before you with joy in our hearts. Joy knowing that the light has come into the world and the darkness did not comprehend it. It did not understand it. it, it cannot defeat the light. And the light is actually still continuing to defeat the darkness, even today in 2021. Uh, if this was true for, for John back when he wrote his gospel, then how much has that darkness been defeated since that time? Father, we thank you that we know how the story ends with the lamb who was crucified for sinners being raised to newness of life. And so we pray, Lord, that we would hear the words of Jesus in every single sermon in the Gospel of John, that he is beckoning and calling and inviting us into the fullness of eternal life. That fullness has that idea of joy with Jesus. So give us that joy, we pray. Despite how our weeks go this week, Lord, 
Whether the darkness seems to be pervasive, we know that the light is always more powerful than the darkness. Help us, Lord. Help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.